So welcome to the first ever Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center Education Program at Home Edition. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Jenny Pollock. I'm the Education Director. I'm thrilled to have this job. And um, with me is my Education Associate, Declan Quillen. Declan, say hello. Hey guys. You see Declan? Cool. So Declan's going to be helping me host this. We're co-hosts today. Um, and uh, we also have two special guests, <clears throat> excuse me, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. But first, I just want to go over logistics with everyone. Um, as Katie mentioned, it's absolutely fine to have um, your camera off. Um, but we are going to do a little exercise in a minute with thumbs up. And um, it's going to be kind of fun to see everybody and who answers thumbs up to which questions. So um, you may want to uh, open your camera so we can all see everybody. But again, it's absolutely fine if you don't want your camera on. Um, and also just a reminder, we are recording so that other people will get the benefit of seeing this lesson. Um, okay, and last logistics is that we're meeting three times, um, three Tuesdays in a row, as you all may know. Um, today, next Tuesday, the 21st, and the following Tuesday, the 28th, where I will be coming to you live from the Yogi Berra Museum and showing you our fantastic Negro Leagues exhibit. Okay. Um, uh, Jenny, should I explain the chat real quick? Yes. And so before I introduce our special guest, Declan's just going to explain how we're going to do questions and answers via the chat function on Zoom. Um, we're going to assume none of you have any experience on Zoom. We're, it's all a level playing field, and Declan's going to explain. Go ahead. Yep. We don't have much experience either, so we're all in this together. Um, yeah. So I, I, some of you guys uh, probably know this, Katie told some of you guys, but if you go to the bottom of your screen, uh, you can click on the chat button and I'm actually gonna send a message right now and it should pop up for everybody um, so that you can see it. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna mute all of you in a second, uh, apart from uh, the people running the program and our experts. Um, so if you do have a question, you can go right into the chat. Uh, you can just type it in and then to send it, all you do is press enter on your keyboard. I'm gonna be moderating the chat uh, throughout the, uh, our presentation and then we'll have like little breaks for Q and A and I'll read out some of the questions. Okay, so now I'm gonna quickly um, introduce our special guests. Um, some of you already saw him. Um, we have Dr. Lawrence Hogan. Larry, say hello again. Just give a little wave so people hello, can see Fox as you, okay. Um, and Kevin Kane is in a peach colored shirt. Everyone can see Kevin Kane. Oh. Kevin says hi. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these two and then um, we're gonna come back to them later in the lesson. Okay, so Dr. Lawrence Hogan, who we're all calling Larry, is the Emeritus Professor of History at Union County College. He is the executive director of the documentary, Before You Can Say Jackie Robinson, Black Baseball in America in the Era of the Color Line. And we're going to show you some clips from that documentary um, in today's lesson. He's the author of The Forgotten History of African American Baseball, and he was a member of the committee that voted 17 Negro Leaguers and executives into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So we are very lucky to have Larry with us. Thank you, um, Secondly, Kevin Kane is a writer, musician, playwright, and teacher. His poem, Breaking the Line with the Mudville Nine was originally written for and performed at the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. And you're gonna to get to hear the poem in our second class next Tuesday. Um, and Kevin's play, A Love of the Game, was first done at the O'Neill National Playwrights Conference directed by Lloyd Richards. And he has had many plays produced in New York City and in regional theaters. Oh, I think we got some new people joining us. He currently teaches music and performance art at the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School in the South Bronx. So welcome, Kevin. Okay, so, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, hello again, everybody. For anyone just joining us, my name is Jenny Pollock. 
I'm the education director at the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center. Um, this is our first at-home edition of the Negro Leagues program, and we are beyond excited to have so many of you joining us. Um, uh, Declan Quillen, who you'll see um, in your grid, is hey my education associate, and he'll be um, helping run the program. So, um, so let's see if I went through all of the, uh, we went through all of our little housekeeping issues. Okay, so here's how today's lesson works. We're gonna show you um, a brief slideshow. It's about 10 minutes long about the birth and the growth of the Negro Leagues. Um, then um, a really cool film clip from um, Ken Burns's um, documentary, uh, baseball, um, showing you Jackie Robinson's first day playing with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, and then we're going to include um, one of our experts, Larry Hogan, um, and some of his documentary. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that throughout the entire lesson, if you ever have any questions, put them in the chat function. And we have two designated Q&A spots in today's lesson where um, we'll address everybody's questions, um, okay? But um, now first, you may want um, to go back to um, seeing a grid, seeing every, as many people as you can, because we're gonna play a little icebreaker game um, to show as many people as we can. Let me see if I can show it on mine. I'm not sure, I think I can. Anyway, um, so, um, basically the way this icebreaker game works is I'm going to ask you a question and if it's true for you, you're going to give me a thumbs up physically. And if it's not true for you, you're going to do nothing. Pretty easy directions, right? Um, <clears throat> okay. Sammy, so, how do we go back to the grid that shows everyone? Um, I guess, Declan, you might have to unshare your unshare, screen. Yeah. All right. I'll do that. Yeah, let's undo that. Okay, there we go. Does everyone see pretty much as many people as you can? Now you should be able to, yeah. Okay, cool. It is more fun this way. Okay. Um, and also what I want to preface this game by is to tell you that um, we've done this program um, many, many, many times with um, students, middle school and high school students at the museum. And at this point in the program, we would have all the kids sitting in the theater, which if you haven't been to the museum, is designed like a little mini Yankee stadium. <clears throat> and um, uh, this is a game called Stand Up, Sit Down. And to get kids' blood moving, basically what we do is I say a sentence, if it's true for you, you stand up. And if it's not true, um, you stay sitting. But given that we're doing the Zoom version, we're gonna do thumbs up, okay? So here we go. Um, so everyone, give me a thumbs up if you have ever played or watched baseball or softball. That's everybody. And I love that we have a young person here with Dan Schaefer joining us. Okay. Um, stand up if you've ever played another, oh, not stand up, thumbs up if you've ever played another team sport. Okay. Thumbs up if you hate sports. <laughs> All right, Donna, you and me. I hate sports too, except for baseball. <laughs> okay. Um, thumbs up if you ever really wanted something and you didn't get it and you thought it was unfair. All right, next one. Thumbs up if you ever felt left out of a group. All right, thumbs up if there's ever been an activity that you've loved so much with all your heart. Almost everybody, okay. And this is the last one. Thumbs up if you ever felt proud of something you worked really hard on. Okay, so maybe some of you who may know a little bit about the Negro Leagues could see how those questions I just asked of you um, are somewhat of a metaphor for the birth and the growth of the Negro Leagues. So now we will get to our slideshow that Declan will be running um, and it will 
make uh, most of the participants um, appear to the side. And uh, can everybody, will you just give me a thumbs up if you can see the uh, slideshow right now? It says the Negro Leagues in big letters. Okay, cool. Looks like everyone can see it. Cool. And I just want to remind everyone to continue to ask questions throughout the slideshow in the chat. Um, okay. Yay, sounds so far looks like everything's going really well. Okay. <laughs> so let's begin our um, Negro Leagues program with our slideshow. So we um, typically do this with kids, as I mentioned, and there's a lot of uh, back and forth asking kids questions and a, and a kind of general conversation about everything. But in this case, I'm gonna do most of the talking for better or worse, and also tell you, because I think it's interesting, the kinds of questions kids tend to ask and the answers they're able to provide. So go ahead, Declan, show us the first slide. All right, everybody who doesn't live under a rock knows who this person is. Um, kids especially, and um, when I say to kids, who's this guy, and why was he important, kids tend to tell me, this is Jackie Robinson, he is the first black baseball player. Now, this is not an accurate statement, as many of you may, not, may know. Um, Jackie Robinson was not the first black baseball player, but he was the first African American player to what we call break the color barrier and join the major leagues, which at the time were entirely white. Um, and most kids think Jackie Robinson is the first black baseball player because they don't know that there was something called the Negro Leagues. So this is where um, sadly many of our educations um, have been deficient. So we hope that in our program that we're sort of filling in the um, important historical gaps, um, particularly a period of African-American history that tends to be forgotten. And that's why we're so excited to have the Negro Leagues exhibit at our museum. Um, okay, so what were the Negro Leagues? Declan, we'll look at the next um, slide. <clears throat> they were essentially a group of professional black baseball players who loved to play and were great athletes and had to form their own league um, because they weren't allowed to play um, with white players. Uh, at the time, there was something called the Gentleman's Agreement, which some of you may or may not have heard of. It was essentially uh, an unofficial Jim Crow law that stated black and white professional baseball players cannot play baseball together. Um, and we feel it's important to note that by calling it the gentleman's agreement, it's essentially this sort of mild mannered or a bit uh, a way of um, placating language that is essentially a form of pretty brutal racism, structural racism, um, and white, one might even consider it white supremacy, in fact. So um, we can see here this picture is of the Detroit Stars in 1920. So um, you guys um, obviously know that now that it's uh, 2020, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Negro Leagues. Um, and let's take a look at the next slide. So obviously we say to kids, what's this a map of? And most kids are obviously can read and see that this is the United States um, and that it's 1900. And then Declan, what we always do is uh, Declan will take his cursor and show us New Jersey. We always go, yay, New Jersey. Everybody see New Jersey? Okay, yay. Um, we have to have New Jersey pride. Okay. And um, then we ask kids, look at the dark gray section. This is a part of the United States that we usually refer to as the South. And kids are usually pretty on top of this part of history. Um, uh, so the question is, why was the population density of African Americans um, so heavy in the South around 1900? Um, and fortunately, most middle and high school students have studied slavery, and they know that slavery is a, was a system by which Africans were forcibly brought out of Africa to the United States, primarily in the South, uh, for the purposes of primarily tobacco and cotton farming. 
Um, but what kids often don't know about is something that happened um, around 1915. So Declan will look at the next slide. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Great Migration. Um, I will admit in my own faulty education, I didn't really know about the Great Migration until I read a book about it in my 30s. It certainly wasn't something I'd studied. Um, but now we're helping more and more kids to know about this important movement. Um, and I'll tell you, typically when we do this uh, for 30 or 50 kids at a time and we ask them to raise their hand if they've ever heard of the Great Migration, maybe three or four kids raise their hand. So this is a problem. This is an important part of history that um, not enough kids are studying. So we point out to kids that essentially what the Great Migration was is um, thousands and thousands of African Americans during the period of 1915 to 1970, moving from the South in the United States up to the North and over to the West. So Declan, if you would point out are these green octopus looking arms, these obviously show us where so many African Americans were moving to. And if you would take a look at Georgia, just to go back to uh, Jackie Robinson for a second, when Jackie Robinson was one year old, his family was in Cairo, Georgia, and they moved from there all the way over to, you guessed it, Los Angeles. And more trivia about Jackie Robinson that you may or may not know is that he graduated from UCLA where he was a star, um, a track star and a great football player. Most of us think of him as a great baseball player, but in fact, baseball was his worst sport. He was an overall great athlete. Um, and a lot of kids don't know that, so it's cool to give them that trivia. Um, okay, so then we pose the question, why would so many African Americans want to move from the South to the North and the West? Um, and here's where we get into Jim Crow laws, which um, of course still existed somewhat in the North, but were much more brutally enforced in the South. Um, and we ask kids to give us as many um, examples as they can of what were some of the things blacks and whites were um, segregated from, and they give us the obvious, you know, uh, water fountains, um, laundry, swimming pools were segregated, restrooms were segregated, restaurants, transportation, movie theaters, schools. Um, you all are probably familiar with this period, so um, I don't need to go into too much detail there. So then let's get back to baseball for a second. So now here's a map um, of uh, if everyone can see all these little red stars. Um, those are uh, places where Negro League teams were cropping up. So Declan, if you'd show us again the area of New Jersey. Yay, New Jersey. Um, you can see there's a lot of stars in that area. Um, and that's primarily because of the Great Migration. So many African Americans were moving to the North um, and particularly the New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania area, that that's where um, a lot of Negro League teams uh, cropped up. So um, it's important for us to teach that the Great Migration and the birth and growth of the Negro Leagues are really very much connected. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at some of the opinions of Negro League players, and I'm going to bring Larry in in a second, one of our experts. Um, so this guy you may have heard of is named Rube Foster. He uh, was what they call the king of the Negro Leagues. He was also a manager and a player. He was a pitcher. And he said, these Negro associations give men like me a puncher's chance. White baseball be damned. And then we usually ask kids, what do you think he meant by white baseball be damned? Um, and after some conversation and some thought, kids finally come around to the idea that maybe many Negro League players felt Forget the white leagues, who needs them? We've got our own teams. We're just as good, if not better. Um, and Larry, what would you like to tell us uh, more about Rube Foster? And well, you know, if, if Rube Foster had been in white baseball, 
doing comparable things that he did in black baseball, he would be at the very top of the executive list in, in the history of baseball. He was a great pitcher starting around 1905, 1906 with the Philadelphia Giants. He is a founder of what is arguably the first national sports team in America, the Chicago American Giants. Uh, he was the manager and owner of those Giants. In 1920, he was the key figure in establishing the uh, first of the major leagues, major black leagues, the uh, Negro National League. 1924, he's the force behind the establishment of the first Negro League World Series. Uh, he's just a large, large figure in the history, not just of the Negro Leagues, but of baseball, period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. And um, just so all our participants know, we have a lot of great photos of Rube Foster in our museum, in our Negro Leagues exhibit. So in our third class, when I'm coming to you from there, I'm going to show you more about him. Um, he also had a younger brother, Willie Foster. Do I have that right, Declan? I think Willie, um, Willie, uh, Willie Foster, who was a left-handed pitcher, and he was also in the Negro Leagues. Larry, do you remember anything about Will Willie Foster? Well, he was a great left-handed pitcher. He was a great left-handed pitcher. And actually, um, he, it, there's a great pose he's taking, and it became the logo of our Discover Greatness um, uh, exhibit. And I'll, I'll show all that to you guys um, in, on day three. Okay, so Declan, let's take a look at um, a sort of contradicting um, opinion about the Negro Leagues from another Negro League player. This is Cool Papa Bell, and there are some... Um, people who believe that of all baseball players, the Negro League players had the best nicknames of any baseball players. And Cool Papa Bell is certainly a good one. And he said, I remember one game, I got five hits and stole five bases, but none of it was written down because they didn't bring the scorebook to the game that day. This wasn't no proper league. Uh, so we ask our participants or students, um, what does he mean by that? This wasn't no proper league. And again, through some conversation with kids, um, they eventually get to the point where they realize even though the Negro League players were proud and talented and playing, they didn't have nearly the resources or money that the major leagues had. They didn't have sponsorships. Um, and then because of that, often the score was not kept or the statistics of people's um, you know, great plays uh, were not recorded, which is really sad for us. Um, and um, that's a really important part to note about the Negro Leagues. Okay, so then in terms of history in 1947, everything changed. Um, this is a famous photo, as you probably have seen before, of Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson. Branch Rickey, if you don't know, was at the time in 1947, the general manager of uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. And um, remember what I was talking about earlier, the gentleman's agreement that you know, most white owners upheld that blacks and whites cannot play together. Um, essentially, Branch Rickey said, forget that agreement, I'm gonna break it and draft Jackie Robinson um, onto the Brooklyn Dodgers. We also love to ask kids a little trivia. Can anyone tell us Sadly, the Brooklyn Dodgers are no longer in Brooklyn. And where are they now? San Francisco. That's right. You knew it. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of baseball. Los Angeles. Oh, excuse me. Los Angeles. Oh, my God. What am I thinking? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Larry. And Declan. Thumbs down, Jenny. Oh, my gosh. Jenny. Um, I was thinking of the New York Giants, of course, are now in, this, in San Francisco and the San Francisco. Right. Yes, the Jenny. Brooklyn Dodgers are now um, in Los Angeles. And great, we have all that recorded, my huge gap. Okay. Uh, yes, Kevin, Kevin, you want to add something? Yeah, just while we're looking at these pictures, when you, it's worth taking a good look at the, the glimpses that we have left of these men who were such heroes. And Jackie Robinson, compared to Branch Rickey, who had been an athlete when he was young. He, he looks like the linebacker that he was. And if you can imagine, you take a good look at that man yeah. and imagine him charging at you if you were a second baseman with those shoulders and that chest that he has. 
And the last picture of cool Papa Bell, there is not a more angelic looking man in this world. And he just, right. you know, to see the, the, there's something about looking at the, the photographs, which are what we have left of that tell you why we, we love our heroes in, in all sports. So you look at them and you think, boy, if I was like that, I, w- I would have yeah. gone places, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's worth, you know, really focusing on yep. that man that we're looking at right there. Thank you, Kevin. That's really, that's really excellent. And also in our third class, when I'm at the museum, I will be able to show you this exact picture in color, believe it or not. Um, Jenny, okay. can I jump in here for just a second too? Yes. Cool was so fast that when he hit a ball through the pitcher's legs, it hit him in the back as he slid into second base for a double. Wow. Now, that didn't really happen. <laughs> that oh. was the speed that Cool Bapa had. And oh. statistics, too. While it wasn't systematically a collection of statistics, there were black papers, a number of black papers that regularly carried statistics so that we have a representative sampling, certainly, of the quality of play that you find in the Negro Leagues. Right. Um, and I'm going to just pause here because somebody asked a good question. Um, uh, yes, Emily, Emily, thank you for recommending the book, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. It is an, a fantastic book. Um, a little while ago when I said that I hadn't learned about the Negro Leagues until I read a book, that's the book that I read um, years ago. I think it's been out maybe 10 years now. Um, but uh, we also got a great question. Who is the Dodger in the picture on the wall? Oh, Lord. Um, I'm going to defer to Larry, Kevin, or, or Declan. Declan, do you have any idea who that is? In this photo with Branch, Ricky, and Jackie Robinson? Yes. If I could see the guy's face. Cut his head he, off. Yeah. His head's cut <laughs> It looks off. like he's wearing a Newark Bears jersey, actually. Oh, yeah? That doesn't look like Dodgers to you? Okay. I'm actually not 100% sure, to be honest. You know what? Um, who I'm forgetting. Did Mark? I think Mark Schoenfeld asked that question. Yes. Mark, let me get back to you on that. I'm going to get, get, I'm going to find out in the museum if the one, the version that we have in the museum um, doesn't cut his head off. So um, we'll, we'll get back to you on that question. Um, okay. So let's keep going with the slideshow because we still have quite a lot to get to. Um, so Declan, show us our next slide. All right. Obviously this is um, the uh, amazing Rachel Robinson and we typically show kids this picture and also now you because we're about to show you a four and a half minute clip from Ken Burns's documentary called Baseball. And in the clip that we show you, Rachel appears in the stands like she does here. And um, at that moment, they don't identify her and we want um, students to know that that's Rachel. Also, Rachel does some of the narrating in the film um, and that isn't always so clear up front. Um, but uh, as a side note, what I want you to know is while sadly Jackie Robinson died in the 1970s at the age of 53, Rachel is still alive. She is 97 and um, is very much a part of helping to open the Jackie Robinson Museum in Manhattan, which of course sadly is probably on hold because of COVID-19. Um, but also um, Rachel and all of the Robinsons are good friends um, to the Berras, the Yogi Berra family, and the museum. And Rachel and Yogi Berra were very good friends up until his passing in 2015. Um, okay, so now Declan, let's go. And um, just a reminder to everyone, we're going to show you this clip. It's about four and a half minutes long. Again, feel free to keep asking questions in the chat and we'll talk more about it on the other side. All right, bear with me for a second, folks. It's just loading up right now. There we go. Um, so I'm actually, Jenny, I'm gonna play the first five seconds and could all you folks give me a thumbs up on your screen if you can hear it. I'm gonna pause that for five seconds just to make sure that everyone can hear it first. Okay. All right, can everybody hear that? Yes. Thumbs up? Yes. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna get it started. To 
history was made here Tuesday afternoon and Brooklyn's flag bedecked Ebbets Field when smiling town Sound is kicked out, Declan. Can you hear me? Yeah, Declan, we just lost sound. All right, sorry guys, give me one sec. I'm gonna stop sharing and then reshare. I think I know what the issue is. Just take a second. Okay, I'm gonna start it over. It should work now. History was made here Tuesday afternoon in Brooklyn's flag bedecked Epps Field when smiling Jackie Robinson trotted out on the green swept diamond with the rest of his Dodger teammates. No less than 15 photographers surrounded Robinson before the game and clicked his picture from every position imaginable. Pittsburgh Curry. On April 15, 1947, at Ebbets Field in Flatbush, in the borough of Brooklyn in New York City, the Brooklyn Dodgers faced the Boston Braves. It was opening day, and for the first time in modern Major League history, a black man, Jack Roosevelt Robinson, was starting the game at first base. There were 26,623 fans in the stands, more than half of them black, come to see Jackie Robinson. Although Robinson went hitless in three trips to the plate, just the sight of him stirred the crowd. I remember the excitement and just the feeling of having gotten through it and a sense that Ebbets Field itself was small enough so that we kind of felt immediately that we could find our place in it. At least I did. The uh, black fans were so tense and so enthusiastic and so their expectations were so high and their aspirations were so high that they just um, reacted to everything. Every swing of the bat, somehow they got something going with the, the black fans. And white fans, I think, were probably more in a frame of mind to wait and see. There was this overpowering feeling that people's hopes were riding on what Jack was doing as much as their interest as fans in the score. The Dodgers won that day, five to three. You can almost divide American history in the 20th century before Robinson and after Robinson. America was defined by baseball. This, this was our national game. So uh, the drama of this moment of Robinson coming in is, is, is enormous because of the uh, game being tied to the national character, in some way the game being tied with America's sense of its mission and its destiny. For me, baseball's finest moment is the day Jackie Robinson set foot on a major league field for the first time in 1947. I'm most proud to be an American, most proud to be a baseball fan. When baseball has led America rather than followed it, 
It has done so several times, but this is the most transforming incident. I can think of no man having a more difficult road ahead of him than Jackie Robinson did in 47, and no one walking that road more valiantly or more proficiently. I, I would say that Jackie Robinson is my great hero among baseball players, and he's my great hero as an American. He is an individual who shaped the crowd. Okay. So our apologies if that was a little choppy. I don't know if anybody else had that. That might be an internet issue. Um, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully you can see all of that. Um, um, and then if you have any questions about that clip, please um, feel free to put them in the chat. And because we're um, in a couple of minutes from now, we're gonna start doing a first kind of Q and A. Um, but uh, one of the things I just wanna comment about, about that clip is that while um, it has a very um, inspiring tone and it must've been an incredibly exciting day, that first day to see Jackie Robinson play with the Brooklyn Dodgers, um, one of the misnomers about the Negro Leagues history is that uh, once Jackie broke the color barrier, everything was great for black baseball players, which was actually not the case. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're so excited to have the Negro Leagues exhibit um, to sort of help tell a more accurate story of what these players went through. Um, and um, so some of you may know that uh, after Jackie broke the color barrier, um, it was sort of slow going for other players to, other um, Negro Leagues players to join um, the major leagues. Um, and for example, it wasn't until 1955 that the Yankees uh, drafted Elston Howard, who was the first black Yankee, and Yogi Berra's mentee, um, and he was a catcher, and they became great friends. But 1955 was pretty late and the Yankees took some flack for that, for being really slow to integrate. Um, so, and we'll look at more of that uh, when um, in our third class, when we're at the museum. Um, but the other thing that we like to impress upon um, students and to all of you is that um, there certainly were important athletes of color um, before Jackie Robinson and since Jackie Robinson. So we like to show this composite that Declan is going to um, show us next in the next slide um, and see if any of you guys can recognize any of these um, famous athletes of color. Um, and Declan, why don't we take a huge risk, this might be really chaotic, and just unmute anybody, I mean everybody. And um, for those of you who can see this, this picture, um, go ahead and call out with the exception of Larry and Kevin, you're not allowed to participate. <laughs> um, does anyone want to tell us if they recognize any of these athletes? Joe Lewis. Yes, you see Joe Lewis. Yep. Joe Lewis is in the upper up, up top. Yep. Mm -hmm. Althea Gibson. Oh, Althea, Gibson. Althea Gibson. Yep. Originally from East Orange, yeah. New Jersey. Willie Mays. Willie Mays is there. Jim Brown. Jim Brown. Jim Brown is there. Nice. Michael Jordan. Arthur Michael Ash. Jordan. Arthur Reyes. Mm -hmm. Ken Griffey Jr. Jabbar. Ken Griffey Jr. So Somebody nice. said something before Ken Griffey Jr. and I missed it. Sorry. Uh, Tiger, Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Bill Russell. Serena Williams. Serena Williams. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Gabby Gifford mm -hmm. or something like that. Gabby something or other. Let's, yeah. Uh, the, the lower right hand corner is Simone Biles. The oh, Simone Biles. Uh, yes. Okay. A lot of kids even the think Olympiad. Gabby Douglas. A lot of kids confuse her with Gabby Douglas. Right, right. It's Satchel Page. Satchel Page is Declan. Do you want to use your cursor and point out Satchel Page? He's in the upper left hand corner. Um, and then Jackie Robinson. <laughs> Jackie Robinson, Sabatia, of course, is there. Um, Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens. Oh, nice. Jesse Owens, the track star of 1936 Johnson. Olympics. Dear Rice. Right. Um, Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson. Mm -hmm. Larry Rice. Woods. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, isn't it? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Can anyone name the uh, pitcher, the Yankees pitcher down at the bottom? Mary Rice. You guys are baseball people. 
Le LeBron James. LeBron James. Mm -hmm. Saquon Barkley. Saquon Barkley. Did, um, did everybody see Hank Aaron? Hank Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron. Mm -hmm. Hank Who are the hockey players? Oh. Who, who, does anyone know the name of that no. hockey player? He's the first black hockey player. Hockey player. No. Declan, go ahead and tell us. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah. It's uh, Willie O'Ree. He's kind of considered the Jackie Robinson of hockey. Uh, he was uh, actually just recently inducted into the uh, Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto. And then uh, the second uh, hockey player down here, who actually now plays for some of your uh, New Jersey Devils, is uh, P.K. <laughs> Subban. Uh, P.K. Subban, in case you guys didn't hear that. So you don't have Carl Lewis on here? I don't think we have Carl we Lewis. don't have Carl Lewis. <clears throat> no. Um, okay, excellent. There's no Larry Doby, another New Jersey boy. Yeah. No, no, we don't have Larry Doby or Monty Irvin. We, mm -hmm. um, but they are well represented in the museum, and you guys will see them on the third, on the third class. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to take five minutes um, for just some Q and A. So um, if you um, have any questions about the slideshow. Um, and you can also be honest, like thumbs up about the slideshow. How'd it go? How'd you feel, feel about that? Well, Interesting, informative, good, apart from my major LA Dodgers gaffe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, it's a lot of talking, I know. So I really appreciate you guys just listening and being patient. Um, so um, Declan, you want to see, I mean, if, does anybody have any questions? Are you guys writing them in the chat? There's some questions in the chat already, and, and I'll, uh, I'll read out a couple to you, Jenny, or I'll, I'll, to whoever can answer them. And you guys keep asking in the chat uh, while I'm reading if you have other questions. So let's, okay. see. Um, let's see. So we're going to get back to the Dodger on the wall picture. So wasn't the other, so Richard Morocco asks, uh, wasn't the other bell quote that he could turn off the light switch and get into bed before the light went off? Yes. Uh, and Larry or Kevin might know it better than I do, but I believe it was that he could get in his pajamas and, and, and tuck into bed before the, the lights went out. Well, apparently it actually happened one night. Cole discovered that there was a short kind of switch in the light and bet uh, Satchel a, a tent spot that he could do it and he did it oh it was Satchel Page, not Cool Papa Bell no Cool and Satchel cool they were roaming together that particular night and there was a delay in the switch and Cool discovered it and bet Satchel ten dollars that he could do it that he could get into bed before the light went out <laughs> apparently That's did it great. <laughs> see I'm gonna learn things too today I didn't know about I didn't know that tidbit well, that's the story. Yeah. All right. So uh, Richard just asked another question. Wasn't there a black baseball player in the late 1800s who played as an American Indian? Yes. And I'll let Larry go again on this one because, Larry, I know you know a lot about this. Well, he was Chief Tokahama. At least that was the name that uh, John McGraw gave him. McGraw, this was 1902. And McGraw uh, tried to sneak onto his rock <laughs> a black man disguised as a Indian, a Native American. It was successful for a very short period of time. And then someone pulled the bell on McGraw. And he, I, don't, I think it was only through spring training before mm -hmm. uh, Chief Tokahama left mm -hmm. the Giants team. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're muted. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Um, and Mark pointed out, note how well-dressed the fans were in 1947. Hard to believe the Dodgers left Brooklyn partly due to poor attendance. I've always noticed that as well, Mark. I kind of, I, I think it's kind of cool how the, uh, the old school, everyone in their top hats and, and full-on suits. Absolutely. And I'm just going to jump in. Um, I'll show this picture to you guys again on the third class when I'm at the museum, but we have a great shot of Satchel Page's All-Stars. Um, all, um, all of these yeah, early yeah, players are about to get on an airplane yeah, and all of them are dressed yeah. up and he since it's the first four years, years, everybody has a hat on. Yeah, so, yeah. You know what, I'm going to ask if anyone isn't muted, if you could mute yourself right now. Donna, I think you're not muted. I and, feel like muted. Yeah, okay. just mute, mute yourself so we don't hear your background noise. Um, but anyway, there's a great picture. And I always say to kids, um, when you get on an airplane, what do you wear? You can say, like this, what I'm wearing right now, like a sweatshirt and sweatpants and 
none of us ever get dressed up to get on an airplane. Um, although now in these times, it's hard to imagine ever getting on an airplane again. But, um, but there's a great shot of Satchel Paige's All-Stars, um, super handsome, super dressed up, getting on an airplane. And it's very much like how people looked when they went to go to the go to ball games. Sorry, Declan, go ahead back to uh, any other questions. Um, let's see. Uh, don't have any other questions as of right now. Let me just okay. Make sure. Um, you pointed out that Emily had mentioned the warmth of other sons, which is an awesome book for sure. Um, everybody should check that out. Um, I guess we'll give it one more minute. If anybody wants to get in a last minute question, we'll, we'll just wait another minute. And if there's nothing else, we'll move on. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious to know, um, was there anything in the slideshow that you, you learned today that you didn't know before? Tell us what that is, if you want to tell us in the, sh in the, sh um, in the chat. And there's no shame in not knowing about the Great Migration. We all have to learn sometime. Uh, so Larry, I think this is Kevin asking this. Are there any other books to recommend, maybe from Larry? Larry, you got any <laughs> book recs? Yeah, this is a very modest author here. <laughs> the, forgotten, the Forgotten History of African American Baseball, edit, or written by uh, Lawrence Hogan, Dr. Lawrence Hogan. <laughs> but the very first book that was written, and he's really the pioneer in terms of researchers and writers, is Bob Peterson's Only the Ball Was White. White. And it still stands up uh, as a wonderful book. He wrote it like 1971, 72. So yes. the two books... Hogan's The Forgotten History of African American Baseball, which takes the story down to the almost the present, and Bob Peterson's Only the Ball Was White. Also, I should point out there are some graphic novels about the Negro Leagues, which are really cool. I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, but especially um, Dan Schaefer, you should know for your young person there, there's a great... Um, Satchel Page, uh, a graphic novel if you're interested in comics. Um, obviously, you guys are interested in baseball, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, and you could Google that and find that. Dan also mentioned that they learned about the Great Migration. That's awesome, Dan. Uh, yeah. Glad to hear it. Um, all right, I think, uh, I think we should move on, Jenny. Yeah, let's do it. Um, okay, so the next, um, chunk of our, which is perfect, the last about 15 minutes of this class, um, um, we're going to turn over to um, Dr. Larry Hogan, who is going to give us a little intro to his documentary. And then I'm going to share um, a section of his documentary uh, called uh, Pop Lloyd, about a famous Negro League player known pop as Pop Lloyd. So um, Larry, why don't you go ahead and start telling us about that, and I'm going to get the movie set up. Well, when we were doing this documentary, we knew we had to connect to John Henry Pop Lloyd, one of the greatest shortstops ever to play the game of baseball. And you'll see that in the clip in terms of the testimony that comes out of people who knew Pop. Well, Pop is long gone. He died in 1962. But the memory of him is not gone. A great hitter, uh, a great fielder, uh, El Cuchado. Well, actually, that was Ray Dandridge, El Cuchado. But there was a name in uh, Spanish that they gave to Pop. He played in, uh, you know, in the winter leagues down in Dominican and down in Cuba and just was a great, great player. Uh, I could go on much longer about Pop, but let's watch the video, which I think presents him quite well. Uh, and this takes us into New Jersey, the Atlantic City Baccarat Giants, which was one of the teams that Pop played for and managed. Okay, and then I just want to make sure. So now, the, I'm uh, you guys. I'm assuming can still hear me. Um, I'm sharing with you the documentary before you can say Jackie Robinson. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see this picture of Jackie Robinson sliding into home and Yogi Berra tagging him out. <laughs> we'll talk no. about that. <laughs> everyone can see that. Okay, because I can't see you guys anymore. But here we go. Um, Take me up to the ball game. I'm gonna start this section, here we go. I just wanted to be a real good ball player. I didn't know, I didn't know whether or not I'd ever play you know, professionally. 
I didn't ever know whether I'd ever play in the major leagues, but I certainly wanted to play in the Negro Leagues. You see, at that time, uh, we had to, we aspired to playing in the Negro Leagues. That's as, that's as, that, is, that was as high as our aspirations could go. And uh, because, now, uh, I, I would say, well, one of these years, maybe I could, I'd like to play for the Homestead Grays, or one of these years, I'd like to play for the, for the Newark Eagles, or I'd like to play for the Lincoln Giants, or I'd like to play with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. If you were a baseball player, you did aspire to to plan with one of those clubs. Mm -hmm. Now we never knew that later on we'd get a chance to play in the majors, but uh, those were our inspirations at that time. We loved the game. We loved the game. We just like a uh, fight was saying, fight is was saying. When we played against one another, we we were like we were really ferocious against one another. Uh, but after the game was over, love <coughs> and peace and harmony. But uh, it was nothing like. Uh, baseball in those days. Well, that's the way baseball was. It was something that you enjoyed doing. It's a fun game. What the heck? Yeah. You're supposed to have fun out of it. They make a business. They make it too too serious now. Really. When they told me they were going to pay me to play baseball, I said, they got to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, I'll play for nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I said, they got to be I always held all these people in esteem because they were great athletes. Uh, and they had a dignity, a kind of uh, self-contained sense of worth. When we look back at uh, the segregation era, we we're, we're oftentimes think of the oppressiveness of it all. And indeed, it was oppressive. Blacks were poor. Southern blacks, uh, in rural areas especially, were without the right to vote. Uh, the Great Migration North had begun to show the signs of failure. But despite all of that, and un underneath the veneer of that oppression, Collectively and individually, blacks were able to accomplish great things. And individually, black men were oftentimes marked with the qualities of decency, respectability. These guys had great senses of humor, and uh, they were great athletes. When I think of those qualities, I often think of Pop Lloyd of Atlantic City, New Jersey. John Lloyd was one of the finest uh, shortstops that, that ever played in the Negro Leagues. He was tall and rangy and uh, had a good arm, and more than anything else, he was a great hitter. There are many recollections I have about uh, Pop Lloyd. Um, I, 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 the biggest thing I'd like to say about him was that he was, he was truly a, a, a gentle giant, and uh, he, was, he was strong, he was a strong individual, he was strong in character, he was an honest man, uh, he was a, a wonderful person, and um, it seemed as though uh, adversity would just seem to fall off of his shoulders and he would never dwell on adversity, that he would always go to the brighter side of whatever might come up at any particular time. He was a lovable man and he was a great ball player. He won one St. Louis baseball writer, referred to him as the greatest ball player. All he was asked to was the greatest ball player, baseball player he'd ever seen. And uh, <clears throat> the sport, the uh, baseball writer said, <clears throat> well, if you mean an organized baseball, I'd have to say Babe Ruth. He says, but if you mean, <laughs> you know, all baseball, he says, it's an Atlantic City colored man named John Henry Lloyd. And he compared him to, to Hans Wagner. And Hans Wagner later said he, he felt honored to be compared with, or have John Lloyd compared with him. But John was a, I just loved the man. You can see that by the tears. I guess Pop Lloyd is partially the reason why I am the mayor today. Because, because Pop taught me to be patient and not to be an angry young man. You see, I was angry because uh, I had gone through the same thing as a professional basketball player where we had uh, been uh, uh, a great ball player and uh, played with uh, the New York Grands, which was a professional team, and yet we were not allowed to play in certain places because we were not white. And uh, when I asked Pop, I said, Pop, aren't you angry about this? Uh, he said, uh, well, I'm disturbed a little bit, but uh, uh, it's just something that happens. And, and Pop would give you that old laugh, and uh, he would just keep on doing what he, he said, your time will come. And I've never forgotten that. Pop always would say, uh, your time would come. 
we, we, we talk a lot about uh, the civil rights movement and when it begins, who, who starts it. It may be that the civil rights movement had many beginnings. Uh, some of those beginnings are found on buses and lunch counters on, on dusky roads in the South and on the, uh, the playing field of Negro baseball teams. Uh, it seems to me these guys must have known that they were involved in the most American of all pursuits, competition. But they weren't recognized, they weren't lionized uh, in the larger American society. They were only recognized and appreciated, if you will, by, by their own people. So I think they must have looked forward to a day when, uh, perhaps on their own terms, they would be recognized as great athletes, great American athletes. Seems to me that those sentiments, that vision, um, is one of the one of the beginnings, one of the seeds of the of the modern civil rights movement. Well, we were down in Mississippi one. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to stop there so we can have a little conversation. Um, and uh, looks like we've got some questions here. Um, Jenny, can I say just a couple of things briefly? Please. Um, uh, and well, um, also, Larry, if you wouldn't mind identifying the older white gentleman who um, gets so moved, because there's, you guys should all know, there's parts in the documentary previously where that man's name is identified. He was a sports journalist, right? Yes, he was. He was the longtime sports editor of the Atlantic City Press, Whitey Grower, James Whitey Grower. Okay. Uh, and there might be other people that we just saw who weren't, whose name wasn't identified. So if you're curious about that, um, tell us in the chat. But go ahead, Larry. Well, uh, I was off camera. No, uh, Tom Guy was off camera, our director. Oh, I was off camera too, obviously. And I asked Whitey, uh, what are your memories of John Lloyd? Now, Whitey had played with John Lloyd, paid, played against him a little bit when he was a younger man. Uh, and Whitey breaks down, as you see, Whitey breaks down and starts crying. And Tom and I knew immediately that that was a special moment that was going to find its way into our documentary. Uh, it's so special, obviously, when someone exhibits those kinds of feelings for someone who came through his life. So that was a very special moment for us. The other thing briefly that I'd say is that if you get to the end of that little clip, and Clement, Dr. Clement Price, is comparing the civil rights movement to baseball, which normally isn't done. But I think Clement is absolutely right that the movement that most people probably would say started in Montgomery, Alabama with the, with the, uh, the uh, strike against the buses uh, started much earlier than that. It started, I would say, anywhere where black people during the era of Jim Crow held themselves forward in public life in proud and accomplishing ways. And they certainly did. Yeah. Often when we teach um, in any of our programs and we teach about uh, Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, we point out to kids that at that time, Martin Luther King was in high school. And that kind of blows kids' minds because we all think of Martin Luther King as being the symbol of the civil rights movement or the beginning. But I also like that Dr. Price says, you know, it may be that the civil rights movement had many beginnings. Did anybody else have any questions about this? Or, and also I would love to know, Larry, why, um, why is it, was it important to you to show this clip about Pop Lloyd? Well, for many reasons, but two of the reasons which I've just stated that moment when Whitey goes back into his past and demonstrates how much Pop meant to him. And then the Clement section as well, where Clement connects us to the larger history that uh, black baseball was a part of. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jenny, you mentioned uh, possibly identifying the other people. Yeah. Uh, Max, Max Manning, uh, who talks about Pop as a gentle giant. Pop was his mentor and Max was a wonderful man in himself. Uh, himself, not just as a great pitcher for the Newark Eagles, but he lived a great life, a good family life. He taught in the public schools in Pencil, in Pleasantville, New Jersey, for many, many years after his retirement from baseball. And Pop and Max were linked together. And Larry, was Max is the player who, who says that the game of baseball should be fun and not just about money? 
Is that no, is that Max? That's that's my friend Gene Benson. Oh, that's Gene. Gene. Okay, so Gene was Max Gene was a great outfielder for the Philadelphia Stars for many years, and uh, just was an excellent ball player. I compared him. And some of you may remember Gene Woodling with the Yankees. I used to compare Ma uh, Gene uh, Benny uh, with. Uh, Gene Woodling baseball wise, but Benny was just, you could see, I mean, he was such a funny man, a wonderful man. And Leon, well, you saw the name Leon there. Leon, yeah. that's one of the highlights, it seems to me. He says, I would have played it for nothing. Yeah. I love the game so much. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple questions in the chat, Jenny. Um, yeah, so go ahead. We started with uh, Emily is asking, did Hank Aaron start out in the Negro Leagues? Yes, he did. He actually, I believe, played for the Indianapolis Clowns for one season. I don't, Larry, could you confirm that as our Negro Leagues expert? No, that, that's correct. And it reminds me of something. People frequently ask the question, were those fellas back there as good as the major leaguers back there being in the 1920s and the 1930s? Well, go through the list of uh, Negro Leaguers who, when they came out of the Negro Leagues, played as stars in the major league. Henry Aaron, Gene, uh, uh, Monty Irvin, uh, Don Nuco, Roy Campanella, and just keep going down the list. So, you know, there was always that kind of quality back there. These fellas didn't just simply appear. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, Richard asks, was it Pee Wee Reese who came out of the dugout and put his arm around Jackie as whites were hurling insults at him? Uh, I'll again defer to you, Larry, on that one. Well, there's an argument going on as to whether Pee Wee actually did that. But in the popular lore, indeed, that's the belief that he did that. And in terms of the kind of person that, that uh, uh, Pee Wee Reese was, it's perfectly acceptable that he probably did that kind of thing if he didn't do that specific uh, moment. Thanks, Larry. Um, let's see here. These are great questions, everybody. You guys yeah. are awesome. Uh, Mark asks Willie Mays, Birmingham Barons, question mark. And uh, I know that he did, in fact, play for the Barons. Larry, you got anything on that? Well, again, it's an example of a great ball player coming out of the Negro Leagues and immediately going up into the majors. Uh, Willie comes up, I think, in 51 with the Giants and is a star right away. Monty is a mentor to Willie, and Willie indeed played for that. And it's a very strong team down in Birmingham with a long history of play in the Negro Leagues. Willie played for the Birmingham Barons. I think his father did, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and, and uh, he actually Mays won Rookie of the Year that year, 51, when he came in. So obviously he was seasoned well in the Negro Leagues, to say the least. Um, all right. Um, any more questions from people? I'll give people a minute or two if they want to ask any last questions for. There's some here um, about, uh, yes, that was Amiri Baraka. Someone was asking the African-American gentleman with the beard. That wasn't, his name didn't go across the stream, but that was Amiri Baraka. Yes. Um, Baraka grew up as a youngster in Newark and his dad took him to Negro League games at the, uh, at uh, Eagles Stadium, uh, Rupert Stadium, excuse me. And he has great memories of going with his father and having uh, those great baseball players as heroes. And his son is now the mayor of Newark. Yes, that's right, Roz Baraka. Yeah. And sadly, they are tearing down the um, baseball stadium in Newark, which don't get me started on that. my feelings about that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but the good news is the Hinchcliffe Stadium in Patterson, New Jersey, um, has gotten some money to restore. So we'll all be able to go visit that someday when we are allowed to leave our houses again. Um, Mark, Mark, uh, Mark Schoenfield put in the chat, uh, Mays is the only player I know of who hit 50 or more home runs 10 years apart in, or 10 years or more apart, I guess, in 54 and in 65. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Uh, that makes me think of, I believe Roger Clemens had uh, two 20-win seasons 10 years apart. Is the only other thing I can think of that's kind of like that. Willie has 660 home runs for his career. And that uh, career was interrupted for two years for Army service, 52 and 53, I think. 
So if you put those uh, years into his playing record, he'd be right there, you know, with Babe Ruth or beyond and in the same voice with Henry Aaron. Let's see. Anthony on Donna's iPad wants to know if Larry Doby was the first major, the first black player to be, wait, hold on, let's see here. Anthony on Donna's iPad wants to know if Larry Doby was the first black player signed by the Indians. I believe he got cut off, but I think he's saying in the American Cleveland. League. Cleveland. Yeah, in the, yeah. yeah in Cleveland Indians. Yeah. yeah so Larry Doby was the first black player uh, in the American League. Just, I believe, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, only a couple of months after Jackie came in, right? Three months. April was Jackie, and July the 4th was uh, Larry Doby. And Doby was always in the shadow of Jackie, and didn't get the attention that he probably deserved, uh, baseball-wise and, and personality-wise, too. But baseball-wise, he's right there with Jackie and, and uh, the pioneers. And I should tell you all, Larry Doby Jr. still lives in Montclair, and he's a good friend to the museum. And um, both he and Monty Irvin's daughter, Pam Irvin, came to the opening last September of the Negro Leagues exhibit at the museum. It was very exciting to have they were like our celebrities in the house, you know, it's cool. Um, and then we've got, Richard has another question here uh, that I'll let Larry answer again. Didn't some of the Negro League teams scrimmage against MLB teams? If so, do you know the record? Well, the, the record has been established. I don't know exactly off the top of my head what it, what it was. Yes, barnstorming in the off season was very extensive between uh, the uh, – all-star teams, you know, put together all-star teams uh, out of the major leagues and uh, teams from the Negro Leagues. And they held their own, the Negro League teams did in all those barnstorming games. They obviously didn't win them all, but they won a high percentage of them. Great. Right. I think that's all the questions we've got this, for now. This is good, actually, because we're coming to a really good stopping place. And now at this point, I can just tell you really briefly what's going to happen next Tuesday. Um, uh, if any of you are still having technical problems, I'm going to be emailing you some stuff. So you'll all have my email and my cell phone number. You should feel free to um, forget Katie. We'll give her a break. You can call and bother me. Um, and um, so we'll start at 11 next Tuesday. You don't have to chime in early unless you want to. Um, and um, just to give you a little teaser, we're gonna hear Kevin's um, awesome poem um, next week and look at more of Larry's documentary and discuss more about um, the history of the Negro Leagues. Um, the last thing I just wanna plug for um, the museum is that um, particularly for Dan Schaefer, you've got a kid or anybody else who has middle school or high school kids in your life or even a little younger, we have an online curriculum um, that's all about American history, predominantly uh, covering the topics of race in sports and immigration. And these are obviously pretty hot topics right now. Um, and it's all free. You can go do anything you want on our website and read what we have and, and use all of our resources and spread the word and tell people because this is how we're going to stay afloat in these crazy times. Um, be, be doing everything online. Um, so I will send you that link because I have all your email addresses. Um, lastly, I'm going to send you um, some fun trivia game worksheets that compare the Negro Leagues history um, part of our museum to the Yogi Berra permanent collection. And then on the third class, when I'm there, I'm gonna be running around different parts like a lunatic, um, showing you the connections between Yogi's era and the Negro Leagues history. Um, but I'm gonna give you that ahead of time so that you can look through it and see what trivia you might be able to connect on your own. Um, the answers will not be there. Um, so Larry, I, you, oh, sorry to cut you off, Jenny. No, I just, go ahead. Uh, Larry, are you, did you want to do the, the, your quote this time or in the next session? Well, I thought we had scheduled it for the next session. Let's save okay. it for the next session. That's all. Yeah. Okay. So thankfully, Larry and Kevin will be with us um, next session. Kevin, do you have anything you want to add? You're on mute. So just remember to unmute yourself if you have anything you want to add right now. If not, then just give me a thumbs up. No, that Good. was great. Great, great program. Great. Yay. I'm so thrilled to have all of you with us. Thank you for all the thumbs up. Um, 
And oh, look at you guys, you fancy techno people. You're giving me like the, the emoji thumbs up and hand claps. Um, we can teach you all how to do that in our next lesson. <laughs> um, fantastic. Mwah. You guys were a fantastic class. I'll see you next Tuesday at 11. Thank you so much for bearing with all the technical stuff, guys. I know it's not easy, um, but it went really smoothly for the most part. It Devin, very good Thank you very much. We, we Thank knocked you. it out of the park, as they say. <laughs> all right. Everybody be well. Stay healthy. Stay home. Take care of all your loved ones. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.